I got new merch. There's hoodies, stickers, and this sweet new Memento Mori shirt that you can swipe. You get it? Because the kanji for forest is read as Mori and Memento Mori. Yeah? Okay, I'll start the video. Links are in the description. The fellas are making fun of my kilt again. Who? The guys at the depot, they keep calling it a scat. One day, my sister and I got our wisdom teeth removed on the same day. And while both of us were lying on the floor, basically hopped up on Vicodin and other painkillers, and unable to walk, we decided to watch Netflix. Because that's literally the only thing we could do. We could barely even eat. It was bad, it was, they gave us some good stuff. We wanted something that we would both enjoy and something that wasn't really that much of an investment of our attention because we were fading in and out of consciousness. I don't, I hear stories about other people who didn't have any painkillers when they got their wisdom teeth removed. We got all of them removed at the same time. It was not fun. That's when we decided to watch one of the first Tinkerbell movies. We thought it wouldn't be anything special, just a quick, hastily made CG movie. Boy, were we wrong. We loved that movie. And the two of us watched all of them together. Again, we didn't really have anything better to do, but it's still a fond memory for me. And that's when I realized that shows that are made for girls aren't just watered down stupid versions of good shows. So I tried watching My Little Pony and then I got hooked on that. And then I tried watching Ever After High, which is still one of the best cartoons I've ever watched. You can fight me on this, I'm not going to change my mind. And that's why I like to make these videos about shows or franchises that are aimed at girls, because I feel like people don't give them enough attention because a lot of them are actually really good. And it was the Tinkerbell movies that set me on that path. The path of not being a narrow-minded dingus. And I especially wanted to do a video about the Tinkerbell movies because I have such a strong personal connection with them. Quick aside, the actress that did Tinkerbell is also the same person that played Roxy in Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. I'm a little bi furious! Before the actual movies, there was a series of books that were being released that flesh out Tinkerbell's character. And those books served as the inspiration for the movies. One thing that stood out to me that I didn't catch in the movies was that they call humans clumsies. There's also a few different quirks the books have that aren't in the movies, and there's unique characters that aren't in the movies also. The first one hits you hard when you find out Ranny is a fairy that doesn't have wings because she cut them off. Freaking metal! Okay, she cut her wings off in order to save someone, but who cares? Freaking metal! What's interesting is that the books take place after the events of the Peter Pan movie, but the movies take place before the events of the Peter Pan movie. Tinkerbell never actually mentions Peter Pan in the movies, but in the books, the, the first one in fact, she explicitly mentions and visits Peter Pan. All the books are like one-shot episodes. There's a problem in them, and then they're resolved in the same book, and they're a very quick read. There's like five words a page. And the reason it's called Disney Fairies is because literally anyone in Pixie Hollow can get a book. There's one on Vidya, surprisingly. This one's actually one of my favorites. There's one of Beck. There's one of, oh, there's Tink. There's Lily, Fira, Rosetta, Dulce, people you haven't even heard of in the movies. There's just a bunch of, there's a bunch of fairies. They have one with Ranny and the Mermaid Lagoon, the one who got her wings cut off. I haven't read this one yet. Freaking metal, dude. The first movie basically shows how Tinkerbell was born. A baby's first laugh somehow spawns a little fairy and it infects a dandelion or something. It reaches Pixie Hollow and you sprinkle pixie dust on it to and boom, you got a fairy. The fun part is that they have a ceremony that determines what your true calling is. And a hammer shines, so it turns out she's a tinker fairy. You know? So that's how they got Tink Urbell. Oh. <laughs> of course, it has the classic trope where she doesn't know what she's doing, so things don't really go her way, and they quickly introduce all of her soon-to-be friends, Fauna, Silvermist, Rosetta, and Iridessa. Also, there's the resident popular girl who's super talented and better than everyone else, so she always looks down on everyone and is super mean because she just 
she's just so much better, and so why should she care about you? Her name's Vidya, by the way. The whole movie is that Tink wants to go to the mainland where us humans live, because it sounds so interesting to her. But Tinker Fairies don't go to the mainland because they aren't needed. Fairies change the seasons, and Tinker Fairies don't have anything to do with the seasons. The whole movie's premise is that Tink doesn't like being a Tinker Fairy and denies who she truly is, and has to go on a quest of self-discovery to realize her own talents are unique to herself. And it's done well. All the characters are enjoyable, it's cute, it's funny, and I think it's a really easy watch. Basically, she comes to term with her own talents, she makes a bunch of gadgets that make all the fairies work faster, and basically realizes she's a super genius. You are quite a rare talent indeed. There's a little girl out there who's missing this. W what do you mean? I think that perhaps a certain tinker fairy might have a job to do after all. On the mainland. So, Tink has a love interest now, sort of. Some guy named Terence, so that's neat, I guess. <laughs> Tink, you can fly. So, autumn is coming around the corner, and Tinkerbell is tasked with making a super special staff for the occasion. Terence has been bugging Tink the whole time, and then... So now she's royally angry and doesn't have a lot of time to fix it. But it's not just the staff that gets broken. Ouch. Yeah, Tinkerbell is screwed. Tink finds out there's literally a magic mirror that grants wishes. So you can guess what she plans to do. She gets lost. Terrence finds out that Tink broke the moonstone and is looking for the mirror. Tink finds the mirror and then... Please, I wish you'd be quiet for one minute. <gasps> And then Terrence finds Tink and they make up. They make it back in time and they actually fix the staff, and this time it works way better. Fun fact, when you actually cut something, it increases the amount of surface area. Because, you know, there's a section inside of that's not the surface, and then you cut it, and then suddenly that section is the surface. And because the blue pixie dust is dependent on how much surface area there is, it actually created a better staff. But this movie would have been better if they got rid of the Void drama. Even though it was supposed to be a make up and be nice to your friends kind of movie, it was still very... Eh. So Tink is captured by a human, and Vidya is the only one that sees. Turns out the little girl likes fairies, and they, they get along very well. And Vidya and the others make a ship to go rescue Tinkerbell because there's a storm. You know, I never would have guessed the fairy that needed rescuing would be Tink. Tinkerbell starts teaching her about fairies, how they work, and their lives, and it focuses on the dream of meeting a fairy and befriending them. That trope that everyone has, and I love it because it's very cute and wholesome to me. If the whole movie was just them being good friends, I'd still watch it. So the other fairies manage to get to the house through the storm. All the while, the dad is kind of a jerk and decides that Lizzie, the little, the little girl, can't have any of this fairy nonsense even though it's completely normal for a little girl. And then Tink finally shows him that fairies are real because she gets angry. Problem is that he's a scientist and wants to capture her. Now, Vidya is captured. They catch up to the dad and manage to convince him to stop being a total jerk by reigniting his childlike belief in magic. Honestly, the interactions they have are cute, but a lot of the movie was a slog. I think it just could have been shorter. Tinkerbell finds out she has a sister that's a winter fairy. They spend the day together, and Periwinkle, her sister, wants to see the warm area. I wish... I wish I could go there. You can see where this is going. They build a whole contraption so that they can show Periwinkle around the warm side of Pixie Hollow. I think she's getting a little too hot. My wings. I can't feel them. They get caught, they're forbidden to see each other again, and that contraption accidentally starts making a really big winter. The seasons have been thrown out of balance. But if the temperatures continue to drop, it will freeze all of Pixie Hollow. They manage to save the great tree, but Tink's wings gets frostbite and breaks, and there isn't a cure for a broken wing. So movie's over, that's it. 
I'm kidding, no. Magic Twin Power saves the day. Gotta admit, a movie where Tinkerbell discovers something about herself and introduces a new likable character and expands on the world and lore in an interesting way? This, this movie was amazing in just about every way. Wow. Okay. This video is starting to get long. I'm just gonna blast through these. So this one fairy experiments with pixie dust and makes them all into different colors, basically gets banished from Pixie Hollow because she screwed up, so she becomes a pirate, steals all the blue dust, and the tree can't make pixie dust without the blue pixie dust, so she screwed everyone over. Eventually her pirate crew betrays her, and Tink and the group help her get the blue dust back, and then she's welcomed back to Pixie Hollow as a Pixie Dust Alchemist. Also, a young Captain Hook is in the movie. This is probably one of the best movies they've made. It expanded how Pixie Dust works, it connected to the original story, and the adventure was so much more entertaining and action-y. Just, I liked it so much. What's funny is that the first time I watched this movie with my sister, I was actually falling asleep and waking up because of all the painkillers, but I didn't realize I was. And so I thought I, I, I thought the movie just sucked, but really I just missed giant chunks of the movie. When I came in to make this video, I was dreading this movie, thinking that it's gonna be terrible. I was horribly wrong. This weird comet wakes up this thing called the Never Beast, and Fawn, the animal fairy, finds it and wants to be friends. Because, for some reason, she wants to befriend every extremely dangerous animal. The fairies think that the Never Beast is big and mean, and Fawn has to prove to them that he's not. Except he actually does turn out to be a big scary monster, so that's a problem. But it turns out he never was a big scary monster, he just wakes up every... thousand years or so, in order to stop a super powerful storm that threatens to destroy Pixie Hollow. Turns out he's a protector. I always like movies where the characters have to learn to be friends, either figure out each other's differences, or learn to cooperate, that kind of thing. And though the whole big monster is actually nice trope is present in this movie, it was still executed very well, if you ask me. And there is the issue of two people trying to save Pixie Hollow, and both of them want the same thing, but have two different ideas about how to get it. And it's that kind of conflict and that kind of, uh, we're on the same side, but not really kind of conflict that I just love, and I think that's what really set it over the top for this movie, because there's the scouts who think that the beast is a beast and evil. So, yeah, the Never Beast was also really solid. So, there's a few movies that were shorter than the regular feature length films. They were about 30 minutes long, but I can't actually get footage of them other than the trailers. So, here's a simulation of me reviewing them. Oh gosh, good, that wasn't what I was expecting. Not really worth your time, but enjoyable. I was really surprised during that table tennis tournament. I'm so happy Silver Mist found her football. I give it an F for fabulous. Oh man, this movie really grinded my gears. The character motivations were just all over the place. I mean, you want to eat food? Really? Unbelievable. I think it's a bad movie. I rate it a Y for why did I watch this? So what happened? You might be thinking that it didn't do well in terms of selling tickets and or DVDs, but that's not really what you gotta look at. The budget for these movies was around $35 million, not including the marketing budget, which is also probably another $35 million as a rough estimate. And the highest grossing movie was Secret of the Wings, totaling $134 million. So there was a $64 million profit. However, that's the best case. The budget remains the same, but the average revenue from the rest of the films was around $72 million, meaning they only had about $2 million profits. And I hate to break the news to you, but in order to make a project lucrative to a mega corporate conglomerate like Disney, the movies need to make around 110 to 120% profit to satisfy stockholders because they're only in it for the money. And the only movie that managed to reach that is The Secret of the Wings. The rest all fell short, so why did they keep making these movies? There's a lot of assumptions I'm making in this, so I'm going to break it down. The marketing budget was probably a lot less than it would be for any typical movie, so there was probably more room to profit than was expected, but that's not really where the Tinkerbell franchise made its money. If anything, the movies don't really matter. What mattered was the sales of the merchandise. Merchandise can make up about 75% of total revenue. So if we assume that Tinkerbell's sales of the DVDs didn't really matter, 
the worst selling movie, The Never Beast, getting only $50 million, if we assume that 75% of the revenue was merchandise, that movie really made another $150 million, totaling $200 million. Subtract the 35 million budget and the 35 million marketing, which is still probably too high, it made $130 million. In order for that movie to be considered a success, it needed to have made $84 million. Check my math on that, I may be wrong. The point still stands. Merchandise is important. The Tinkerbell movies came out in 2008 during the Great Recession, and Disney actually managed to kick everyone's butt during this time period. I'm not going to throw numbers at you anymore, so don't worry, I'll boil it down to the main points. Basically, when the first Tinkerbell movie came out, it was only on DVD because Disney was trying to save money. And the first Tinkerbell movie outperformed what they originally expected. They thought it would sell half a million copies, but it sold 660,000 copies instead. Disney saw that the Tinkerbell movies were actually doing a lot better than they originally anticipated, and since the economy really sucked during that time period, they just switched their attention towards this. As the years went by, and the last movie, The Never Beast, came out in 2015, Disney realized that the economy was getting better and that they could make more money doing something else. You know what else came out in 2015? Star Wars The Force Awakens and the Cinderella live action movie. I hate the Cinderella movie so much. It's very pretty, but oh my God, it's so boring. If you ask me, Disney only dropped Tinkerbell because they knew that they could be making more money with Star Wars and live action films. And well, they did, a lot more money. I mean, I don't think I have to show you the numbers to know that they made a lot more money. Tinkerbell was really more of a product of the 2008 recession. They needed a cheaper movie series that would sell well. If you ask me, I would say that Tinkerbell was only really pursued because of the economic situation during that time and not really for any other reason. There was supposed to be a movie called Tink, where Reese Witherspoon would play Tinkerbell, similar to the Maleficent movies, and that was announced in 2015. Movies can take several years to come out, so there is a slight chance this could still be happening, but I'm guessing that Disney is holding on to the script and waiting for a better time, since there isn't much appeal for the character in this moment. Sadly, even the magazines, shovelware games, comic books, and the very uncomfortable Tokyo Pop manga, Tinkerbell was still cast aside. To be frank, I'm actually really happy that this is the reason why it stopped. It, it never meant it was unprofitable. I don't think there was any rational point in time when it was considered unprofitable. There was probably a time when the merchandise wasn't selling as well, but because it was still successful and it ended successfully, most likely, if a situation ever occurs again, Disney would be willing to bring back Tinkerbell as like a reserve safety, hey, we need a franchise that people like that we can fall back on. But that's all I have for this video. Tell me in the comments who your favorite fairy is, either from the movies or from the books. What fairy do you stan? Also, you can follow me on Twitter and tell me what fairy you stan. Hashtag I stan this fairy. That can be misinterpreted so much. I didn't realize what I was saying until it came out of my mouth. Share the video if you're nice, stay beautiful, and keep playing.